Whoa there, Harry. You sure are consuming a bunch of phenylalanine. Phenol what? All I'm doing is drinking some Diet Coca-Cola. Phenylalanine. It's one of 20 amino acids that we use to synthesize protein molecules. Of these 20 amino acids, phenylalanine is one of the seven that are essential. This means we must obtain all our phenylalanine from foods such as nuts, animal products, and artificial sweeteners, because our bodies cannot synthesize it. Wait a minute. So if I need phenylalanine to make protein molecules, shouldn't I get as much of it as I can? Not quite. Because phenylalanine is an essential amino acid, it must be strictly controlled. If too much phenylalanine is present, the amino acid can become toxic and causes neurological damage. On the other hand, a lack of phenylalanine leads to decreased synthesis of proteins and neurotransmitters. The amount of phenylalanine is controlled by an enzyme called phenylalanine hydroxylase. So let me get this straight. We need phenylalanine, but it has to be just the right amount, and so we use something to control that called phenylalanine hydroxylase? You got it. Phenylalanine hydroxylase is an enzyme whose responsibility is converting phenylalanine to tyrosine by adding a hydroxyl group to the aromatic ring. The PAH gene, which is responsible for making phenylalanine hydroxylase, can be found on the long Q arm of the chromosome 12 between positions 22 and 24.2. Okay, what does this phenylalanine hydroxylase look like? We can actually look at the structure of phenylalanine hydroxylase in four different ways. This picture shows the primary and secondary structures of the enzyme. The black letters in the picture show the series of amino acids that make up the enzyme's primary structure. Above those letters is the secondary structures that are produced as a result of the bonding between neighboring amino acids. Each molecule of phenylalanine hydroxylase consists of multiple beta-plated sheets, which are indicated by arrows, and alpha helices, which are shown by spirals. Next, we have the tertiary structure, which is made by folding the secondary structure. Within each molecule of phenylalanine hydroxylase, there are three domains, an N-terminal regulatory domain, a C-terminal tetramerization domain, and a catalytic domain. The N-terminal regulatory domain, residues 1 through 142, is shown in yellow and contains an autoregulatory or N-terminus sequence, residues 19 through 33. Meanwhile, the C-terminal tetramerization domain, residues 411 through 452, is shown in red and is responsible for interlocking three additional molecules of phenylalanine hydroxylase into a tetramer. The catalytic domain, residues 143 through 410, is the purple portion of the enzyme and the center of catalytic activity. It has an iron ion, shown in green, at its center, which is important for enzymatic action. This domain acts as a hydrophobic cage for the phenylalanine substrate. The last structure is known as the quaternary structure, which is made by combining multiple tertiary structures into a larger unit. In humans, phenylalanine functions as a tetrameric unit. This means that four molecules of phenylalanine hydroxylase, which are held together by their tetramerization domains, combine and function together. These pictures both represent tetrameric forms of phenylalanine hydroxylase. However, the one on the left shows the cartoon structure which highlights the alpha helices and beta pleated sheets. Meanwhile, the picture on the right is a space filling model. Whoa, okay. So it looks like phenylalanine hydroxylase is a very specific structure. But how does it change phenylalanine into tyrosine? The hydroxylation of phenylalanine to tyrosine requires both tetrahydrobiopterin, or BH4, and oxygen, and occurs during two main steps. First is the oxidation of the BH4 cofactor, which creates a reactive hydroxylating intermediate. And second, is the entrance of oxygen into the amino acid substrate. Once phenylalanine hydroxylase has been activated, BH4 binds rapidly, which results in the phenylalanine hydroxylase 117 BH4 binary complex. Once phenylalanine enters the active site, it binds to form a ternary complex to which O2 rapidly binds. This picture begins with a representation of the phenylalanine hydroxylase 117-BH4 phenylalanine ternary complex, which includes an iron atom bound to two histidine residues and one monodentate glutamine residue. 
This complex has just enough room for two molecules of oxygen to bind inside and undergo a series of rearrangements before the phenylalanine substrate is hydrolyzed. This next picture depicts the same mechanism, but shows the transfer of electrons, as well as a more 3D representation of the active site, substrate, and cofactor. Here you can see that the iron molecule is an important aspect of the active site because it binds to the oxygen in some of the intermediates. The residues histidine 285, histidine 290, and glutamine 330 are also vital in this mechanism because they are responsible for stabilizing the iron molecule while it binds. Man, that sure is complicated. So if phenylalanine hydroxylase is constantly working, how does it not use up all of our phenylalanine? Great question, Harry. As I've mentioned before, phenylalanine is necessary for the synthesis of proteins and amino acids, but it can also lead to neurological damage if too much is present. As a result, phenylalanine hydroxylase must be strictly controlled to achieve an optimum concentration of phenylalanine. This regulation is achieved by three main processes, BH4 cofactor inhibition, substrate activation, and phosphorylation. In BH4 cofactor inhibition, the BH4 cofactor binds to the active site to form phenylalanine BH4 complex, which causes the enzyme to undergo a conformational change and pulls the N-terminus further into the active site. This change blocks off the active site to inhibit the substrate activation and enzyme phosphorylation. In addition to this, substrate activation can be used to regulate phenylalanine hydroxylase. Each molecule of phenylalanine hydroxylase has two sites at which phenylalanine can bind reversibly. Phenylalanine binding to the active site is what causes the molecule to be hydrolyzed into tyrosine. However, it is the binding of phenylalanine to the allosteric site that activates the phenylalanine hydroxylase. Once the allosteric site has a molecule of phenylalanine bound to it, the enzyme undergoes both local and global conformational changes which moves the N-terminus and exposes the active site. Therefore, a molecule of phenylalanine must first bind to the allosteric site of the enzyme before the enzyme can hydrolyze a molecule of phenylalanine in the active site. In phosphorylation, a molecule of phenylalanine binds to the allosteric site of phenylalanine hydroxylase, and the conformational change allows the active site to be phosphorylated. This phosphorylation, which occurs at serine 16, causes a conformational change in the active site and displaces the N-terminus. As a result of these changes, there is an increase in not only the active site's accessibility, but also its affinity to phenylalanine. All right, so now we know how phenylalanine hydroxylase functions and how it's regulated, but how efficient is it? Luckily for us, phenylalanine hydroxylase works pretty quickly. We can compare speeds of reactions by using dissociation constants. The smaller the dissociation constant, the faster a complex is formed. The binding of BH4 has a dissociation constant of 65 micromolar and occurs very rapidly. The binding of phenylalanine, on the other hand, is slower because it has a dissociation constant of 130 micromolar. Are there any enzymes that are similar to phenylalanine hydroxylase? There are two, actually. Once phenylalanine hydroxylase synthesizes tyrosine, the amino acid is used to synthesize multiple neurotransmitters. During this process, tyrosine hydroxylase acts on the molecule and adds an additional OH group. Not only do these two enzymes have similar biochemical roles, but they also have similar structures. Both phenylalanine hydroxylase and tyrosine hydroxylase function as tetramers and utilize an iron ion. These two enzymes, along with tryptophan hydroxylase, which shares the functional and structural similarities are called the aromatic acid hydroxylases because phenylalanine, tyrosine, and tryptophan all have aromatic rings in their structures. Because of these similarities, it is inferred that these enzymes have evolved from a common ancestor. Man, phenylalanine hydroxylase sure does seem like an important enzyme. I'm glad it works so well. It definitely is. Some people aren't as lucky though. Phenylketonuria, or PKU, is an autosomal recessive disorder in which there is a mutation in the PAH gene. As a result of this mutation, phenylalanine hydroxylase is not present, and phenylalanine reaches toxic levels, 
causing a decreased synthesis of proteins and neurotransmitters, light hair and skin, and mental retardation. Although there is not currently a cure for PKU, these symptoms can be managed if the individual begins a low phenylalanine diet during infancy. By maintaining a strict diet and avoiding phenylalanine high foods, those diagnosed with PKU are able to live normal lives. Luckily, newborn screening tests are now able to detect PKU right after an infant is born. And as a result, there are much fewer cases that result in severe mental retardation. Wow. I am so appreciative of the fact that I have phenylalanine hydroxylase. Thank you for helping me learn about this important enzyme. No problem, Harry. Enjoy your Diet Coke.